think we'll begin. Um, uh, there are source packets on the, on the <coughs> table in the middle of the shul, if you can, I guess everyone has it, okay. So, I'm very excited about this three-part series, The History of the Torah. It's a bit of a daunting topic, uh, which I'm finding a little bit overwhelming, but uh, I'm gonna give it a brave attempt. Uh, and I want to start by just saying what I'm trying to do. It says I wrote, I, so once, once I kind of formulated for myself what I'm trying to do, I wrote it down on this outline, and we can sort of follow along with the outline as I'm going to be speaking. Uh, I, I didn't provide sources for, uh, for each point I want to make, because um, I thought, you know, the packets are kind of uh, big and heavy enough, but uh, if, if there's like a particular point that you'd like some sources to look at, we can, I can send you in the right direction or provide you uh, sources later on for any of these things that we, that we discuss. Um, so, it's not a history lecture. I'm not really qualified to speak about the history of this time period, um, or really any time period, nor is this a lesson in bibliography, which would be a lot of fun, but that's not what this is. And you know, maybe that would be, if you want that, we could do that at different, we could do that in the Beit Midrash, and we could go through uh, the books and talk about like just pure bibliography. What, what are uh, the books in the Jewish library? What I'm trying to do in these lectures, I mean a little bit, is a, a religious history of the Jewish library. Okay, so I want to tell a story uh, that's informed by history, but is a religious story, um, a religious history of the Jewish library. So um, what I'm not going to talk about, though, I'm going to skip over uh, Tanakh. I'm going to skip over scripture, the Hebrew Bible, uh, which is sort of, I don't know, I don't know why I, I didn't think to include more, but I guess I figured, um, uh, I don't know, I don't know. For whatever reason, I thought uh, that you can, you can read, I mean, you, it's, it's there, it's a book, you can read it. Uh, we read a lot of it every week in shul, and uh, I think, um, I don't know, I, I, for whatever reason I, I decided not to speak about that. We can talk about that also at a different time. And actually, this uh, Mosei Shabbat, I'll be speaking in Skokie with Rabbi Yadi Helfkat about some issues of uh, scholarship and, and, uh, and, and Tanakh. But what I, I'm, I'm gonna speak about is the Torah Shabbat, the oral Torah. And this is a distinctive element of rabbinic Judaism uh, and the precursors to rabbinic Judaism that set it apart from all the other different groups that were contending for the allegiances of the Jewish people in the Second Temple period. There were, you know, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Essenes and the all, you know, maybe dozens of other Jewish sects. And the ones who became our ancestors were distinguished in their belief that in addition to a written Torah, the Tanakh, basically, uh, there's also an oral Torah, okay? Something that was verbally communicated by God to Moshe, when Moshe received the written Torah, he also received this oral Torah that was passed down through oral tradition uh, unto you know, the rabbis who created the, rabbinic, the early rabbinic library. And uh, so what is this oral Torah and where does it come from? So you actually have two different ways in which oral Torah is spoken about. And I sort of just some examples of that are source, uh, source two and source three. Uh, in, in a Gaidic statements, in statements that aren't legal, in statements that are homiletic or philosophical, uh, or narrative, you find very expansive statements, broad statements about the comprehensive nature of the oral Torah. So here's a famous example: Amar Rabbi Chia Bar Abba, Amar Yochanan, my dikti. What's the meaning of the what's written in Deuteronomy? Valeim kachol has rima shir divar Hashem and mechem bahar, and on them was written according to all the words which the Lord spoke with you on the mountain. It teaches. That Moshe was taught by God all of the, all of the little, uh, the minute details of the Torah, the minute details of the scribes, which I assume means uh, scribal uh, traditions as well. And what the scribes are going to, in the future, innovate. Uh, for example, this is in second Megillah, reading the Megillah. So reading the Megillah, which is a, you know, happened is a, is a ritual that was enacted by the rabbis uh, with, no, with, obvious, with no Torah authority. It's not a Torah mitzvah to read the Megillah. Uh, it's a rabbinic piece of legislation in response to something that occurred in post-Torah history. Uh, according to the statement, was revealed by God to Moshe and Harsinai. It's a very expansive claim for what the oral Torah means, and there are many other similar statements in rabbinic literature that, that, that assume or that, that speak of this comprehensive revelation uh, of an oral Torah that included all the, the, the details of, of Jewish practice, Jewish thought, etc. On the other hand, 
when we actually look at legal sections of rabbinic literature, we find, uh, you know, like any specific answer to a specific question, how, is, how do we know this? Um, where is this law derived from? What's, what's the reason? Uh, almost never. Not almost never, I would say, but very rarely, let's say. Rarely, only rarely, in rare instances, is the answer, this is a tradition that goes back to Moshe Har Sinai. The Talmudic phrase, Halacha le Moshe Sinai, it exists. It means this particular law was taught to Moshe at Sinai. It's an ancient tradition going back to Moshe. It's used, I don't know, several dozen times in, uh, in the business, right? In the country, you can, you know, we, we can look it up. It's a small number of, of legal details. In contrast to hundreds upon hundreds, thousands of rules and mitzvot and details, that are derived from verses. And so just as an example of that, um, I picked this almost at random. Uh, this is from the, the Sifrei. The Sifrei is a, is a midrash halakha. So it's a halakhic, a legal midrash on, um, here are the book of Bin Midbar, the book of Numbers, uh, describing the ability of um, the, the, the um, that, that vows are, um, um, are obligatory, but a husband can, in certain circumstances, can annul his wife's vows, and otherwise you can go to a chacham, you can go to a sage or a rabbi who can annul your vows if you, under certain circumstances. Um, and what we have here is, is a, a very sort of technical unpacking of what this verse means. La sori sar nafsho, to bind a bond upon his soul. Okay, leman emar, what's the intent of this? La fisha hu amer, kachol yotzei mi pidi everything he says he has to do. In the Ella, shot see the fiv, keep out loud, beneath the Rishfu Adminai. And maybe that's only if I, uh, uh, if he actually says it. What if he, uh, sw- um, um, oh, sorry, that's, that's, uh, what, what if it, uh, well, what if he accepts upon himself in, in sort of an oath or a vow? How do we know that that is something that's true? Uh, they ask to keep it time. Lamar, let's sorry, sorry, enough show. Uh, um, that it, therefore it says, anything that he binds upon himself, he has to keep. What if he takes an oath to eat forbidden foods? And eat, I, I swear that I'm going to eat uh, non kosher food. creepy crawlies. Okay? So then I'll, I'll, read the other, I'll, I'll bring the other verse to, um, to, to, uh, to bind a bond. Um, in other words, la sor isar, la sor etat mutar, velo la tir In other words, the oath is about. Uh, binding upon himself things that are permitted by the Torah, but you can't take an oath to permit something which is forbidden by the Torah. So it says everything, in other words, there's a redundancy in the verse. It says to bind upon your soul, and so everything is, comes out of your mouth. If it just said everything out of your mouth, I might have thought it needs some sort of verbal expression. Maybe there's some other, maybe I can just say, um, I can make some sort of less, um, other types of language, other types of ways of assenting to an oath or a vow, uh, also included. So it has to say, um, and that's why the Torah says phrase it that way. But if I had, um, everything comes out of your mouth. But if it had said um, only that, I would have thought that I, what if I can make an oath to permit something that's forbidden by the Torah? So that's the language of Lasor, right? To for- forbid something that was otherwise permitted. So I, we don't have to, this is not a topic right now. The point is, uh, these are important details of, um, of like Jewish law, Jewish practice that are, uh, seemingly like the, the product of this type of very close technical reading of these verses. And you can, you know, there are all sorts of assumptions, right, that there's no superf- superfluicity, uh, every word has a meaning, every phrase has a meaning, if something could write, set, all, there are all sorts of there are herme- hermeneutical um, principles that this is based on. There are ways of reading text this is based on, but this is, you know, people sat around and they read this and they discovered these rules. It doesn't say uh, this is from Moshe. So how do we understand, how do we understand um, not just uh, the purpose of the oral Torah, what is the oral Torah, but, but where does it come from? So there are a couple of people, everyone writes about this. This is a major question in Jewish thought. I have sort of four sample uh, responses here. Rambam and Ramban uh, offer very different perspectives. Rambam, uh, Maimonides, in a Well, how many tell the story? Let's go back even before. After the rabbinic period, uh, it start, starting with the Sadi and uh, in the, it was in the 10th century, and then through Maimonides, you have um, 
Judaism is challenged by Islam, it's challenged by the Karaites, and, and so you have sort of writers defending Jewish tradition, defending Jewish practice in light of these, these new challenges. And uh, part of the way they do that is, uh, one of the stances they adopt is by, um, uh, by grounding more of, of Jewish practice in, in, in tradition rather than in this uh, type of exegesis. And so you see a movement away from saying this type of derivation, uh, this type of, of midrash, this type of learning out uh, of legal material uh, doesn't actually generate religious law. It really, rather, it is, um, it, uh, is an ex post facto linkage of a law that they knew already from tradition to, a, um, to the text of the Torah itself. I'll try to make this clear. Whereas if it were actually derived, and Manabi says, Rambam says, it wouldn't be a derite. Okay, so let, let, me, let me try to say this a different way. That, that sounded confusing, even to me. Um, there are 613 mitzvot in the Torah. This is a, an ancient rabbinic tradition. Uh, I, I think I've spoken about this before. Uh, if you open up the Torah and you read the mitzvot, you start counting the mitzvot as you read, um, you might come up with about 613 mitzvot, but you're probably not going to come out with exactly 613 mitzvot. And if you want to, if you believe there's 613 mitzvot in the Torah, and you read the Torah and you're counting, making a list of all the mitzvot as you go along, uh, you're going to have to be very clever to come up with 613. So people did that, right? So in the Gaonic period, there was somebody who did that. In Maimonides uh, as well, he did that. Um, Maimonides did that as well. Uh, and he wrote a very famous book called Sefer Mitzvot, where he lists all 613 mitzvot. And also, before that, he has to explain the criteria that he's using to the criteria that he's using to determine what counts as one of these 613 and what doesn't. So if it's not a perpetual mitzvah, it doesn't get counted. Right, like, I don't know, like God told Moshe to you know, speak to the rock and water comes out. It's not a mitzvah, right? God commanded it to Moshe, but it wasn't a perpetual uh, mitzvah for all time. It doesn't count as a list of 613, for example, okay? The Torah is lots of the, you know, general exhortations to observe mitzvot, those don't count, okay? These are Rambam's principles of what counts in a mitzvah or not. The, one of the things, he, the most controversial thing he says, though, he says, and this is a source, um, source four on your, your packets, uh, anything that is learned, um, anything that is learned, the shorish I read, the first shorish is that, um, um, sorry, sorry, the first one is that if it's rabbinic, it doesn't count. If it's rabbinic, Legislation. If the rabbis added this, so for example, like lighting Hanukkah candles is not a, one of the 613, it's not from the Torah, the rabbis added this mitzvah. Uh, reading the Megillah and Purim, celebrating Purim, these are all rabbinic mitzvot, none of them count. The second rule he says, it's not appropriate to count anything that is learned from one of the 13 hermeneutical principles, the midot, the, 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 the ways of, of, of reading and understanding that, the, that we use for interpreting the Torah. So what I just read to you from the Sefra in Source 2, uh, where we're, again, we're sort of darshaning, we're explaining, we're explicating, we're discovering meaning, uh, Ravim says, none of those count in the 613 Mitzvah. That can't create a biblical obligation. Biblical obligations are based on an intact tradition. And these creative Midrashim are, can only create rabbinic legislation. Because it's, that's created by humanity, that's human uh, creative reasoning. The Ramban strongly disagrees and says, if you follow that uh, understanding, then you know, huge parts of the Torah make no sense. A huge parts of the Torah of literature make no sense because you have many mitzvot, many details of mitzvot that we say have the force of deoraita, they have Torah force, and they seem to be derived from, from, these, um, from, these, um, from these midrashim. Okay? Uh, Jumping ahead, you know, several centuries, you have an extreme, two other extreme positions, also similarly extreme. You have Sam Trevel Hirsch, who writes, I mean, in, in a, uh, who writes, source seven, the written law is to be to the oral law in the relation of short notes on a full and extensive lecture on any scientific subject. So for him, he reverses the importance. He says, the written Torah, the Chumash, the Sefer Torah, that's just the notes you take in a lecture. Remember you used to take notes in lecture? Okay? Um, it's just, you just jot down a few key phrases. Uh, what's the actual lecture? The lecture is the oral Torah. So somebody gives a complicated, detailed lecture, that's God telling us the oral Torah. 
how to keep Shabbat, how to uh, offer the Korbanot, how to, all the laws and rituals of Judaism. And Moshe, and the written Torah, that's Moshe's like, it's like his notes. Just a few key phrases to help us remember. And so what then is the process of rabbinic literature? It's all about um, using the notes to recreate the lecture. But the really important piece for Sarah is the oral Torah. That's like, that's the fullness. Now, if you just have the written Torah and you don't, and you weren't at the lecture, if you missed the lecture, you're not going to be able to understand it. You're just going to, it's like you, if somebody, you know, you miss a lecture and you get the notes from somebody, it's hard to understand because you didn't hear so you, you some phrases on this piece of paper. What are, what are they alluding to? What do they mean? So we, however, we have the oral Torah. So we have the full lecture. And rabbinic literature is reconstructing the lecture. It's the written record of that lecture, the reconstruction of that, le of that lecture uh, based on uh, the notes and the notes of the Torah. So this is a very, I don't know, counterintuitive because uh, it kind of reverses our, our normal understanding that like the written Torah, that's a really important one. The oral Torah is commentary. It explains the written Torah. And he says, no, the oral Torah, that's revelation. That's what God taught to Moshe. That's how to observe Judaism. That's what this religion is all about. The written Torah is just the notes that we, that we use to help us remember the oral Torah. And at some point in time, that got written down also, right? The, the, the oral Torah got written down, so okay. That, that's sort of seven. Yeah? Is he saying that the written Torah wasn't given by the no, it was. It was. I mean, it's a kid. It's a metaphor. Sorry. The written Torah is also absolutely word for word dictated by God, but it makes no sense on its own. I mean, that, and that, I mean, that's true, right? I mean, I would say, look, the written Torah doesn't, you can't, you can't follow the written Torah. It tells you to do things without telling you how. Without definition, it tells you to keep Shabbat. It doesn't tell you what that entails. Shabbat, a huge part of our lives. You know, you, you know, spent, uh, in Yeshiva, I spent the better part of a year studying Hilchot Shabbat. I could spend another three years before, you know, really feeling confident in it. Um, well, what do we have in the Torah about the laws of Shabbat? Almost nothing, right? So, um, it's the written Torahs, it's cryptic phrases. Uh, without, without the oral Torah, it's really, it's really hard to understand the written Torah. The question is, what, what is, the, is the oral Torah um, what humans discovered from the written Torah? Or is the oral Torah what um, um, the, just this comprehensive gift of God where he told us all those details? And the written Torah it accompanies it to help us remember them. Right? The oral Torah was in fact oral for a long time. Okay? It wasn't written down. So if you have this massive oral tradition, it's helpful to have a written Torah that reminds you of all those mitzvot and all those details. What is it? The metaphor that you use about the... Yes, the metaphor does not write. It's like the professor gives you the lecture, you know, gives you the, gives you the, uh, what do you call it, the, the transparency, I don't know if you're going to write. Okay. They, you know, just like I, you know, like I gave you the outline of what I'm going to say, right? So, okay. I'll do it, okay. That, that's the... I mean, what, what, he's, what he's responding to, though, he's responding to people, Professor Hirsch in the 19th century, responding to people who looked at these midrashim and thought these, these explications and thought, this is ridiculous, this is not what this first verse means. Like the Torah, you know, there's, you know, the, the, you know, there's even a, there's a joke which, uh, um, there's a joke which goes as follows, you know, God says to Moshe, um, so it's, it's a, I heard it as a joke. It's actually was, it was written in like an anti-rabbinic like book, you know, in, in the early modern period. But the joke, which is the version, you know, same exact argument. But the the, the the joke version is God says, "Moshe, look to shall give the mo. Don't boil a kid in its mother's milk." And so Moshe, oh, you mean we can't? Uh, Moshe says, oh, you mean we can't? Uh, uh, we're not allowed to have, to cook any dairy product with any meat product. And God says, no, 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 loads of a shell be Oh, you mean we're not allowed to, uh, to eat any dairy and meats of any kind that have been cooked together? And God says, no, 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 loads of a shell be And Moshe says, oh, you mean you're not allowed to derive benefit from any dairy product cooked with any meat product? And then God gives up and walks away. Okay? So <laughs> the Torah does say you, should, you can't boil a kid in its mother's milk three times. And we learn all of these three, those are the three laws that we, that we in fact, that, that rabbinic tradition does derive from the threefold repetition of that prohibition. But at various times in history, people looked at that and said, this is insane. Like, that's not, the, that's not what, the, what you can't read. Like, that's not what it means. It's not the simple meaning of this verse. Um, and so, Senator Phil Hirsch is saying, well, why would you expect to understand it just looking at it? Why, why would you expect to be able to read the Torah and make sense of it? It's just, it's just, it's just the notes. Uh, but you, you only can only make sense of it with the oral Torah. And the oral Torah is from God. That's the comprehensive, like, revelation of this religion we're supposed to follow. 
the Nitziv, and Tzali Tzvi Huda Berlin takes almost the opposite approach. And I don't have a source for him on this. I don't think I could. I, I mentioned there are not, there's not material in the source packet for everything I'm going to say, but I can send you in that direction. You can look at his introduction to his commentary on the Chumash, where he speaks of the Torah being described as a song and a poem, which the Torah does, in fact, in Sefer Dvarim, the Torah does refer to itself as a, as a song or a poem. And then it sort of writes about the poetic nature of the Torah. And one of the things, like, what, what's, how is poetic language different from prose? Poetry it has illusions. Poetry can't be understood literally. Sometimes a poem is like, uh, you know, um, ever seen these, like, uh, um, you know the song American, um, uh, American Pie, you know? Right, you know, there are versions where, like, every line is like a reference to some event in history, right? Or you can get those like commentaries. So like some songs are like that. Sometimes if you have a little extra information, you can understand the poem better because you know that this line is referring to this thing that happened, in, right? So that's what the Torah is like, it's a poem. So the oral Torah, uh, first of all, it's not, it's not crude, bad reading. It's just treating it like a poem rather than prose. And the people who are interpreting had outside information, which is great. Like, it's good to have outside information when you're trying to interpret a poem, which makes allusions to things that you might not, that, that aren't contained in the text itself. So he does the opposite approach. Senator Hirsch tries to, don't, don't, don't forget about the, don't try to, you know, see the connection. Don't try to, you know, the, the written Torah is not the source for the oral Torah. The written Torah is just uh, to help you remember. It's just the notes to help you remember the oral Torah. It's a mnemonic device. Then it says, no, the written Torah is the source for the oral Torah. Um, but you just have to understand that it's not prose, it's poetry. And poetry works a little bit differently uh, than prose. So that, that's what is the oral Torah. So the oral Torah is either, either when God gave us the Torah, God gave us, when God gave us the written Torah, either God also at the same time gave us a much, much larger and expansive um, oral Torah that was passed down orally teacher to student for Jennifer centuries. Uh, that's Rosh Hashanah Hirsch's opinion. And later on in history, when the rabbinic library, the library of Chazal of the, the rabbinic period, they went, you know, they, they, they wrote that down and they created ex post facto connections between the written Torah and the oral Torah. In other words, they you already knew, you know, that uh, they were not allowed, to, they already knew that we're not allowed to, um, eat dairy and meat together, or cook them together, or drive benefit from when they're cooked together. That was known, because God said that to Moshe. In like a, that was part of the lecture. God taught that to Moshe. Moshe taught that to his students. That was known for centuries. And in the rabbinic period, they thought, you know, we really need to, as we write, down, as we write all this down, let's create a tie. Let's look in the Torah and find a way to, to take this law that we already know and root it back in the Torah. That's one, that's one way of understanding oral Torah. The other way of understanding the oral Torah is to say, I don't know, when God gave us, God gave us the Torah, and he taught us a few other rules as well that aren't in the Torah, uh, that we need to understand. And then he basically said, yeah, and I want you to interpret this. I want you to make this, like, like live your lives based on this very somewhat cryptic and short book. And the, that empowering, empowerment uh, gave rise to uh, this, this um, explosion of the oral Torah. And that would be maybe the Nitziv's position. That's the other end of the spectrum. Each end of that spectrum has, be has benefits, right, and, and costs uh, from the perspective of, like, I don't know, like, like having a foundation for our religious lives. The advantage of the position, the Sam Shukla Hirsch position, there was a comprehensive revelation of the oral Torah, is that everything that we do, like, you know, not cooking uh, dairy and meat together, like, it's, that's from God. Like, God told Moshe, don't cook, eat, or drive benefit from dairy and meat that were cooked together. So our religious lives are grounded in a tradition that goes back to God and Sinai. The disadvantage of this system is like, what the heck was the Talmud all about if all the, they knew all the answers already? Because it seems in rabbinic literature that they didn't know the answers already. They were spending a lot of energy and a lot of time in arguing and, and, and unpacking and disagreeing about the significance of each phrase in the Torah. If they knew the answers in advance, why, why go through that, that game? On the other side, uh, the Ramban side, maybe the Nitziv side, uh, the advantage is, well, now we understand what they were arguing about in the, t in the Talmud, right? Now we understand what was at stake in the rabbinic project of Midrash Halakha, of darshaning, explicating, explaining, interpreting the legal portions of the Torah. They were trying to figure out, what does God want of us? The Torah says three times, don't boil a kidney in its mother's milk. What the heck does that mean? How do we live our lives that way? So, 
okay? Um, so it was real what they were doing. Uh, the disadvantage for us, I think, is that our religious lives are now built upon readings of, of the Torah that are no longer intuitive to us. We can't recreate that. The way that they read, the tools they used, the methods they used, the sensitivity, that's somewhat or a lot foreign to us. And so our religious lives are based on, like we're living our lives based on, you know, uh, you know, Rabbi Kiva thinks there's a vav here in this verse, and that means X, Y, and Z, and so, okay, so now I, uh, I can't have my chicken parmesan, or whatever it might be, you know, okay, like that's, you know, that, that can be destabilizing maybe to some. Um, yeah. But, but if, according to the Benazir's theory, at what point does the Torah, does the interpretation stop, though? Great question. So what's, okay, let's, um, that's a very good question which maybe I'll get to next. If I don't answer the question in like half an hour, ask me again. Mary? Well, I was just gonna say, as somebody who grew up without like not being in the Jewish tradition, but still having Tanakh, mm. um, like when I first started learning Jewishly, it, um, to me, there's like a lot of emphasis on Torah, but um, there's nothing, there wasn't anything Jewish until I moved into Gemara. Mm. Um, so like, for me, like all of that debating, it, 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 it shows values and priorities and mm. like a system of like how we prioritize and how we question. Um, and that is something, right? Like if I were to take my Torah experience in Judaism and my Torah experience in Catholicism, mm -hmm. they're mostly the same. Same. That's interesting. I see like the story of Jacob and uh, the well and this and that, you know, that, that you don't have to be Jewish to kind of talk about that kind of story. There like, aren't, uh, there aren't, for me, there aren't, uh, in my, from my perspective, there aren't Jewish priorities in Torah. That's interesting. That's really interesting. Like written Torah. That's really interesting. Um, come back next time. No, not, not, next yeah. week I'm not teaching, but in two weeks when I teach the part two, we'll talk about the, the, the Rishonim and we'll talk about Pshat. And we'll talk about this, what, what, what the value is of that sort of non-rabbinic a reading of, of scripture, and uh, we will talk about that. I think, you know, the other just thing I'll point out, which I, I you know, um, the, the printing press was invented in, where 1450 something, Jews embraced it right away. We started printing books at great speed early on. Uh, the first Hebrew book printed is Chumash with Rashi, with Rashi's commentary. Every subsequent edition of the Chumash, the Torah, that was printed by Jews contained Rashi's commentary from whatever, in, from the 15th century up until 1950, when uh, current publishers in Jerusalem printed a Tanakh without Rashi's commentary. So there's definitely like the Jewish way to read scripture is through this prism of our chain tradition, which is not, I mean, the Catholics have that too a little bit, right? But um, differently, obviously. Yes. Perhaps the way around Hirsch is that the oral law is ever evolving. He was part of a tradition that certainly that became I, I, I don't think he meant that. I think he meant, uh, I mean, I think he would, of course, feel, you know, the tradition of Torah study and halachic life and scholarship is, is ongoing, um, and interpretation is always possible, etc. I think he, I think he meant, though, like the actual, like, body of rabbinic literature, like the rules, the mitzvot, per se, that are derived from these midrashim, he feels is, um, is the, uh, is, is part of that revelation. Let me, let me talk a little about, the, let me continue the story, okay? So, and, and talk a little also about the, the library, because um, well, hmm, it's sort of hard to do this with, but let's, I'm, gonna, I'm going to lay down my, I'll uh, sort of show my cards, and say, everybody okay? Uh, um, everyone good? Okay. I'm going to show my cards a little bit, and say that my alliance is more in the Ramban, Nitziv side of things this side over here, uh, and so that, that may come, come across. So let's, so we have this oral Torah, we have this charge by God to interpret the Torah, just to live according to the Torah that requires us to interpret, uh, and uh, at some point this, these traditions get written down, and they get written down in several different genres of literature. So I want to talk about three genres of literature and what they, uh, and then we'll, get, then we'll talk about the Talmud itself. So that's, that's Roman numerals two, three, and four, on the, on, the, on the outline. So Midrash Halakha is collections of Midrashim. Yeah, some of them, you know, how old they are and when they were edited, and I actually don't know any of that, and, but we, there are books that tell you if those questions are interesting. But let, let's assume that some of it goes back to, you know, very, very ancient, ancient times. We have 
uh, Midrash Halakha, which again, uh, works of uh, explaining the, significant, the legal significance of legal portions of the Torah. Like the section I, the piece I showed you in Source 3 from the Sifrei, okay? It's legal chapters of the Torah expounded to get, like, what are all the legal implications of this? And there are collections of Midrash Halakha, like, okay, the Sifrei, the Sifra, Torah Kohanim, uh, there, are, there are books of this. Um, you can also find Midrash Halakha quoted in, in the Talmud as well, um, you know, in segments of, of, this, of this genre of rabbinic literature. Uh, within Midrash Halakha, we find a couple of different uh, approaches. So, the story, you know, Hillel is a very famous, you know, famous, uh, famous guy. Uh, what did I... Oh. I've already the Malvim. The Malvim is like the Nitziv on steroids. I forgot to. The Malvim, I, I skipped over. The Malvim, uh, he felt that uh, if you really like uh, knew your grammar really, really, really well, you know, it, everything made perfect sense. And you could look at the written Torah and you could recreate all of uh, rabbinic uh, Midrash Halakha based on just like a very careful reading of, of the Torah. And it's like, and he wrote a Torah commentary that tries to do this. And it's like, if, if you believe in, if you trust him, like nobody else ever has to write anything else you know, ever again, just he like solves it all. So he, again, talks about, um, um, he said the drashot are akin to the deepest sense of pshat. Um, so, pshat so, so, okay, that's. So the story in Psachim uh, is of a case when the 14th of, this doesn't happen this year, this is the, the 14th of Nisan, of Nisan was on Shabbat. Okay, so Erev Pesach was on Shabbat. Um, that's not this year. This year, um, Erev Pesach is Friday, which is much easier. When Erev Pesach is on Shabbat, this happened a few to happen in 2005, and then maybe one or two other times since then. Uh, it happens occasionally when the, the 14th of Nisan, Erev Pesach is on Shabbat. Would you remember what's so, what's so uh, troubling? What's, what's, what are all the big questions we'll deal with? Do you remember from those years? When do you destroy your, uh, when do you search for chametz? When do you destroy the, can't burn the chametz because it's Shabbat? What do you eat for Shabbat? You can't eat matzah, you can't eat bread because your house is already clean, right? right? These are all the questions that everyone deals with. In the time of the temple, though, when this happened, they had a much bigger question, which is the 14th of Nisan, that's the day when everyone brings their Paschal sacrifice to the temple and they slaughter it and then they eat it and they go home and they cook it and they eat it at the Seder that night on the 15th of Nisan. So it, it happened. The Bnei Batera, who were in charge at the time, they forgot, are we supposed to bring the Korban Pesach this year or not? It had been many years since Erev Pesach, this, uh, the 14th of Nisan was on Shabbat. And before they had a fixed calendar, it could be many, many years, you know, without the, you know, the, those days aligning. They didn't know, they didn't know what the rules were. Uh, and this is the Hillel, uh, famous Hillel, at that time he was not yet famous. He had just immigrated from Babylonia, and uh, he sees his moment, and uh, he, and he says, um, or, or, or actually they say, Hillel is kind of, you know, he, he studied with Shemayin of Talion, the great scholars of the prior generation, and he'll, he'll probably know, they go and they fetch him, they ask him, and he says, he says to them, it says in Numbers, it's season Mo'ado, and it says regarding the Korban Tamid, the perpetual sacrifice that was offered twice every single day, Mo'ado, it's season, it's time. Just as the Korban Tamid, the daily offering, overrides Shabbat, we offer it on Shabbat, so too the Korban Pesach overrides Shabbat. Furthermore, we can have another type of, so that's a, that's called a, um, that's like a Gezer Shava argument. That's a argument by analogy. The same word is used in two different sections of the Torah, and so we can learn the law from one case to the other. Mo'ado, it's is a phrase that, occur, that occurs in context of the daily sacrifice offered twice every single day, including Shabbat, that overrode Shabbat. And then that same word appears in the description of the Paschal sacrifice. So just the daily sacrifice overrides Shabbat, so to the Paschal sacrifice overrides Shabbat. And then he makes another argument where he says, um, just as the daily sacrifice overrides Shabbat, but if you neglect it, there's no severe punishment of karet, of spiritual excision. If you miss your Korban Pesach, there is a severe punishment. So certainly that would override Shabbat because it's so much more important, it's more strict. It's more strict. That's called a Kavachomer kind of argument. If this is true, then even the more so, the Korban Pesach overrides Shabbat. In the, in the Babylonian Talmud, they love it. They immediately make him Nasi. They appoint him to be the, you know, sort of in charge of the rabbinic uh, community. And uh, 
what happens then? Then he begins to sort of say, once he has his power, he says, you know, the reason why you, uh, why did you have to bring me, this Babylonian, to come in and to Jerusalem to become the Nasi over you is because you weren't sufficiently, none of you were, were, were diligent students enough. You didn't serve Shemayin at Eftalion with, with due diligence, and that's why I knew the answer and all of you forgot it. So uh, once uh, he said that, um, he, he sort of, uh, that's sort of like a wrong thing to say. That's like, a, you know, uh, like spiting fate or something, you know, like you, so as soon as he says that, he forget, you know, then they, yeah, so, okay, so tell us, uh, do we bring the Shekita knives with us? How do we get them to the temple? We can't carry on Shabbat. How do we get the knives that we need to slaughter our Korban Pesach? And he says, oh, I don't know, I don't remember. <laughs> uh, and he says, uh, I, 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 uh, I heard an answer, but I forgot it, so I don't know what to do. So then he says, you know what, let the Jewish people figure it out. If they're not prophets, they're the children of prophets, and they'll figure it out. What they did was they took the knives, and they kind of stuck it in the wool of the sheep, or between the horns of the ram, and they sort of, the animals sort of carry the knives uh, that way to the temple, and they were able to shake it. Which actually is, is something kind of uh, wrong about making the animals carry the knives, you know, okay. Uh, <laughs> but it all worked out very nicely, and, uh, and then once he saw this, oh yeah, this is what I remember from Shemayin of Time, this is what I learned Shemayin of Time. The Yushal, this is the Babylonian time. the Yushal, the Palestinian Talmud tells the story the opposite way, where um, he makes all of these arguments uh, of why the Korban Pesach, the Paschal sacrifice, overrides Shabbat, and they don't, they, they, they're all refuted until he tells them, oh, we actually, also, I heard this from Shemayin of Talia. And then they accept the answer. And in that version of the story, we have a moment where Hillel is sort of saying, we're allowed and, and we should and we ought to discover new things in the Torah based on this sort of, this, this type of reading, this type of close reading and logical analogy. And, and we don't know the answer to this question, so we'll figure it out based on, based on, the, on our learning. And they're like, well, I, I don't know, Hillel. Like, I, don't, I don't think that's, uh, uh, I don't like that. Uh, if we don't trust that, those arguments can all be refuted. Uh, and it's only when he says, well, also I have a tradition, that they accept. And so you have this tension between, and, and Hillel is representing learning uh, new methods of discovering meaning in scripture and a more conservative element that wants things to be based on tradition only. Or all tradition also. And this gets played out for several additional generations until we have the last of the great um, adherents of this uh, philosophy of traditionalism is Rabbi Eliezer. Rabbi Eliezer, uh, they should make a movie, like a, a little TV miniseries out of his life. It's a very dramatic life. Uh, I have some of the sources that describe uh, his, his story. It's, I'm not going to read it, it's very long. Uh, Rabbi Eliezer had a wealthy father. Rabbi Eliezer ben Herkinus had a very wealthy father. Uh, who was a farmer, and all his children worked on the farm, and he counted on his children to work on the farm, and Eliezer wanted to go and study Torah in Jerusalem. And, you know, like, you know, we've, we've seen this story before. And his father says, you can't go to Yeshiva, I need you in the farm. You have to, you know, you know like he wants, you know, he needs his, needs his help, and, and Eliezer runs away from home and goes to study with Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai in Jerusalem, and his father uh, wants to disinherit him, and uh, so he goes to Jerusalem to like kind of, you know, really tell off his son. And by this point, Eliezer has become somewhat of a famous young man. He's sort of set himself up apart and, and made a name for himself as a great scholar, as a great student of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zaka. And so when his father comes, I'm Hercules, and so Rabbi Yochanan says, oh, you are the father of my great student. You know, he gives him a seat of honor at the banquet, and he... Um, And he, and he asks, he asks, um, Rabbi Yochanan Zaka asks Rabbi Eliezer to like, say something. I got this banquet that your father's at, and I want to you know, show off how you're my prime, my, my prime student. And Eliezer says, I can't say anything in your presence, because I, I don't say anything. I can't say anything that I haven't heard from my teachers. And you're my teacher, so what am I supposed to say in your presence? So Rabbi Eliezer is represent, and the story ends, you know, the father and son are reconciled. He sees his son didn't just waste his time in yeshiva, he made a name for himself, and Rabbi Eliezer becomes a great student of, um, of Ryochem and Zakkai, and the father and son are reconciled. But we see in this, this exchange, um, right? Um, Can a, can, a, can, a, can a spring you know, give more water than it has? Can a well give off more water than it contains? No. 
Uh, how could you say more Torah than was, uh, uh, what was, um, so, sorry, that, that's, that's the answer. He says, I can't, I can't speak to you. He said, I can't say anything. He says, um, sorry, sorry, sorry. But the Ezra says, I'm a boor, I'm a cistern. A cistern uh, absorbs water from the rain. It collects water from the rain, and then you use it during the dry season. So he says, my knowledge is like a boar. I can't, it's a cistern. It's impossible for me to give off more Torah than went into it. You're my teacher, I can't say anything that I haven't heard from you. Uh, and so, I can, not gonna speak, what can I say in your presence? I only say that which I heard from my teachers. And the Ezra says this, in other places as well. I only say what I heard from my teachers. And Yochanan says, no, no, you, you got the metaphor wrong. It's not, you're not a cistern, you're a well. A well can, uh, is a source for new water. A well, nothing goes in and more water comes out and that's why it's possible to say more Torah than, than we heard at Sinai because we discover new things. And that's where Yochanan's kind of response to him. And, but that shows over the Ezra, even at his young age, in this sort of moment with his father and his teacher, kind of staking out a position for himself as this sort of, you know, this... Uh, Kind of arch conservative who you know like only like carries on the old ways, only says what he heard from his teachers, doesn't discover new things, uh, and we see this throughout his throughout throughout rabbinic literature. The other you know uh, another example that comes to mind is the um, Rabbi Ezra seems to be uh, opposed to the creation of a fixed liturgy. You can't say you shouldn't say the Amidah. Uh, you can't pray from a siddur. If you pray from a siddur, you're just reading from a book, and that's not tachanunim. Prayers should be like a supplication, something really genuine and sincere. But what we used to pray in the old days, you can't write a text, you can't, you know, we can't pray from a text that somebody else wrote for you. That seems to be what's, what's happening in this, in a, in a Mishnah, in a Sechet Bracha. So again, he's a defender of the old ways, and the, sort of the, the story of his, of his, sort of the end, his downfall, is the famous uh, story of the oven of Achnai, where he gets into a dispute with Rabbi Yeshua, and, and he, he's so convinced he's right, he calls miracles down. Uh, to try to prove his arguments, and Yeshua is saying, what, what is there? I, no, no, like, what, that's not how we solve things. Uh, you're sure you're right, you're bringing miracles to prove it, but, but we're, we're actually like, discovering meaning in our deliberations, and, and, and we follow majority rules, and, and that's how we're going to solve things. And uh, Eliezer gets, he gets excommunicated after that episode, um, and not only is he, and, and um, Yeah, so the story, the story is uh, interesting, you know, I guess in terms of this thing about, um, uh, in terms of uh, the story, he, he, he doesn't, um, he says, uh, if you pray from the Sidur, your prayers are not tachanunim, so the, uh, uh, the, story, the, the story, at the end, at the end of the story is that his, uh, um, he was married to the sister of, um, Right. He was married to the sister of Reverend Gamliel, is that right? Is that the, yes. So once, this, once he's excommunicated, Reverend Gamliel, uh, his, sis, his wife, who's Reverend Gamliel's sister, doesn't let him fall on his face, meaning tachanuni, doesn't let him uh, engage in this type of supplication prayer, that's a prayer because surely her brother will die, will, she knows her brother will die once if, if she lets her husband pray. So she tries to like, you know, distract him from praying in this way that only he can pray, and then one day it doesn't work out, and Ima Shalom, that's her name, right? And then it's, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, for whatever reason, she wasn't able to stop him, and she sees him falling in prayer. He's falling on his face, and she's like, hey, you just killed my brother. Like, I, I, you know, like, I, I know that happened. Um, so, it's sort of a sad end to that story. Really, Ezra, though, again, to the very end, like, he's this guy who, uh, um, this arch, Traditionalist in some ways, and, and doesn't um, so you can't get with the program of, of the more creative style of learning. Um, within those who are embracing midrash and, and new discoveries in meaning, there is a, there is also a division between Rabbi Shmuel and Rabbi Akiva uh, and their approaches. Now. Uh, there were scholars in the 19th century, early 20th century, who made a big deal of this and felt that all of Midrash Halakha can be uh, divided between uh, Rabbi Kiva and Rabbi Ishmael. I think that's been questioned 
my more recent scholarship, and not exact, but but as, as two approaches, it's worth. And you know, Heschel wrote a whole theology of uh, rabbinic Judaism based on this dichotomy between Rekiva and Rishmael. So it may be a false dichotomy, but uh, there are certain some statements where where it seems to be uh, play itself out. So that's source thirteen. Uh, basically, Bishmael is, is the advocate of this position that the Torah will turn the down. The Torah speaks in human language, which means that sometimes things in the Torah don't have significance, because like people, when people speak, not everything has significance. The Torah adopts human language, uh, and therefore you can't like derive meaning from like every curious like superfluity, etc. In the Torah, whereas Rabbi Kiva thinks the Torah is this totally divine like supernatural document, doesn't speak in human language, and every jot and tittle, every, you know, vav, you know, inserted here or left out there can be used for deriving meaning. And there's a story here of a, of a confrontation where, um, um, uh, right, 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 Kiva sort of says to Rabbi Shmuel, it says, bat uvat, and he directs, right? It says, there's an extra vav, the, the, the daughter of a Kohen, uh, who has, uh, like I said, a certain type of uh, forbidden sexual uh, relationship. She is executed in a special way. She, you know, she's, she's burned in, in a way that she wouldn't if she weren't a Bat Kohen. Uh, and uh, Rabbi Kiva ex expands this category based on a Vav. And Rishmael says, um, <coughs> You're going to kill this woman because you, know, you have this weird way, because this Vav in the word, okay? Because if this extra letter, you're going to kill this person. You're going to punish her in this way uh, based on such an extraneous, like that's not, that's not, uh, that's not real, okay? Rabbi Rishmael thinks that like, just as human language isn't omnisignificant, you can't assume that Torah has that same level of omnisignificance. So those are two, those are sort of, that's a distinct category in, uh, in Midrash Halakha. There's also Midrash Agada. Those are, you know, these are maybe more familiar, you know, like the, the stories, the legends, these are um, rabbinic interpretations, expansions of, um, of the stories in the Torah, okay? Um, and this is also a big part of rabbinic literature. Uh, three things, I have three things to say about that. One, uh, just so you should be aware, Rambam Imanides writes about the impossible stories, the miraculous stories, the strange stories. He says, uh, there is a sort of conspiracy between the skeptics and the fundamentalists concerning those stories. Because you have the fundamentalists who say all of these impossible other they, 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 these are stories that couldn't be true because uh, they describe impossible things. Uh, so the fundamentalists say, well, you have to believe them. They're there to be They had to happen like that, literally. And you have to believe that. And then the skeptics say, yeah, you have to believe it literally. And that's baloney, so the whole tradition is baloney. Yeah, so there's a symbiotic relationship between the fundamentalists and the scoffers. They be, oh, both of them agreeing that you have to understand these, take these stories as, as, as literally true. Or I guess they're literally true, or they're just garbage and, and you reject the whole package. And there's a third group, Maimonides says, that he thinks is the true one, which is uh, uh, you just interpret them not literally, okay? The, the point, it's impossible for it to have happened this way, so it didn't happen that way. It happened some other way, and figure out what, what the point of the story is. What, what is it telling us? What information is telling us? Other piece, uh, the point that Ramban, Nachmanides, in the, in, the, in the course of what, in 1263, he has a dispute with uh, the Christians in Barcelona, and the content of that dispute, he makes this point, which is that these Agadot are not binding. All of these Agadot are just a rabbi got up one day and said something. And if people liked it, that's great. If they didn't like it, then that's also okay. They're not obligated, there's no, there's no obligation to accept any one of them. And so, in the context of his debate with the Christians, if they, you know, threw some strange Agadah, he was like, yeah, I don't think that's true, I don't know. You just don't, you don't, you're not binding. You're not to, he doesn't have to be, like, part of the sort of normative Jewish way of seeing the world. Uh, none of this is binding. In contrast to maybe the legal work of uh, Midrash, which does create, you know, you can't, uh, uh, does create the legal meaning of these verses, okay? So the legal meaning of the legal portion of the Torah was determined uh, by Chazal, by the rabbinic, by the rabbis, but the uh, homiletic meaning of the narrative of the Torah was not determined in such a conclusive, decisive way. That's that's Ramban. Uh, the other thing I'll say, just in terms of understanding all of these agad these agadot, these stories, legend expansion, especially like when they expand, you know, passages in biblical narrative and they include episodes that aren't there in the text, you know, like. Uh, you know, Abraham thrown into a furnace, all the, you know, the stories of that sort. So, um, 
here too, you don't have to, you know, it's very similar to how we understand the halachic midrash. It's not necessarily the case that they see this extra word, this extra phrase in the Torah and they like discover, you know, the story based on that word because the word doesn't suggest that story. It could be that the story is, like, makes contextual sense. Like, you know, the story is responding to us to a question, not a textual question in, 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 a, in the sense of this word, but like, like, like Abraham's story to the furnace, okay, for example. So, uh, or Kastim, Abraham was from Or Kastim, uh, so Or sounds like Or, sounds like the word for light and fire, so it must have been that uh, he was a thrunch of furnace. Um, but they're not, they're not focusing on, it's not Or Kastim, like that word implies that story. It's the question they're answering is, uh, where does Abraham come from? Like, like, what, what, like, how does this person, why does God say Lechachah to Abraham? We don't know anything about him before that. So what's the backstory? So they're responding to uh, a, a question that is in the Torah. Like, if you read the Torah, you, you do wonder, like, who is this person? Uh, where does he come from? Why does God speak to him? And so this story responds to a real question that a subtle, careful, contextual reader of the text would come up with and provides an answer to that. And they pin it on, you know, this phrase, but it's not that the phrase is generating that, uh, that story. Okay. Mishnah, okay. What do I want to say with the Mishnah? Um, yeah, okay, yeah, no, 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 okay. If you don't get to part five today, I'll do it, I'll, I'll add part five onto uh, part two. Meaning Roman numeral five about the Talmud, I may just take that and stick it on to uh, the next class in the series. Um, that made any more sense, but let's. In the year 200, uh, this oral Torah was collected in a book of sorts called the Mishnah. I say book of sorts because I think most historians think the Mishnah wasn't actually written down, it was edited as an oral book in the year 200 under the guidance of Rabbi Huda Nasi, uh, Rabbi Judah the Prince, uh, and this is the collection of, like, the Oral Torah, like, like that's like a nice, definitive, nice, authorized, edited version, um, and you see in them, and he, orga and, the, and he organized it in a very nice way. There are, you know, there's some history of like the backstory of the Mishnah. Maybe people wrote proto Mishnahs before him. That he was basing himself on. There's some evidence of that, um, but you know, that, you know, but what, but nonetheless, there was some task that was accomplished in the, around the year 200 in the editing of the Mishnah. What do we say about the Mishnah? Mishnah is uh, divided to six parts. The six parts are kind of the six uh, spheres in which the oral Torah and the written Torah as well kind of deal with the six areas, broad areas of Jewish law. Uh, there is Moed, which is, uh, is Ryan. Ryan, which is the agricultural mitzvot, agricultural laws. There's Moed, which is the seasons, the times, the Shabbat and holidays. There's Nashim, marriage, divorce, and the more complicated permutations of each of those. There is um, uh, Nezikim, damages, interpersonal financial stuff, including harm that people cause one another. There is um, Tarot, the purity rules about who could access the temple and access sacred food, and how impurity is transferred from object to object and person to person under which circumstances and how it's removed. And there's Kachim, which is the sacrifice, all the sacrifices, the sacrificial order and all of its rules and regulations. Um, I compare this to the Burgess Shale. The Burgess Shale was a series of fossils that were discovered uh, in Canada. Uh, Stephen Jay Gould wrote a book about the Burgess Shale in which he uh, it, it, it's, it, it's a, uh, they're, they're very old fossils. They show uh, life forms from the, the, the Cambrian explosion, this like explosion of diversity of life forms. And Stephen Jay Gould argued that when you realize just how wild and diverse life was, um, like there were, you know, so f entire phyla that, were, that went extinct shortly after, so much more diversity uh, at this early stage of the history of life then subsequent, subsequently, and, and he says this, this means that you, the kind of the, the way we often depict uh, evolution or depict life forms is like a tree and it's a branch, and then it kind of branches out into diverse, into this like more diversity as time goes on. He says it's really the opposite. You had maximum diversity at the beginning, most of it went extinct, it was decimated, and you have a few and everything else, all, all of the history of life after, you know, uh, 250 million years ago is just a few variations on a few small, remaining themes. Um, 
that there's much, you know, like, you know, all the body parts are more or less the same uh, from the surviving life forms compared to the diversity we had before. And I, to me, that there's something of that in the, the Mishnah is, um, the six orders of the Mishnah and the tractates that they contain cover, like, spheres of Jewish law and Jewish observance, many of which have, like, not been developed by later rabbinic history. Like, there's no, um, uh, there's no Talmud in most of Tarot. So you have one-sixth of the entire Mishnah that has never been, like, Talmud fight. We'll talk about the Talmud next, but, like, whatever the process of creating the Talmud was, uh, you know, the way that these Mishnahs were studied in the subsequent academies and expanded upon and developed, that only happened to a certain portion, up to majority of them, but only some of them, not, not all of them. Uh, and even the sections of the Mishnah that did have this Talmudic process done to them, they were studied in the Talmudic academies, the later Talmudic academies, not all of them were studied in post-Talmudic academies. And uh, not all of them got incorporated into the uh, medieval codes of Jewish law. And so, uh, in, in fact, you have uh, tremendous, you know, a lot of the halachic um, scholarship uh, that, that we have is, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, the number of books and words written is, has increased an exponential um, scale, but on, on a narrower and narrower number of topics, when you go back to the Mishnah, as you, and you take that as like a baseline for, you know, all of the areas of the Jewish life. So if you assume that every parak, every chapter of Mishnah, you know, is equally like sort of one, you know, limbs, you know, maps out a, an equal, an equally important or scale size of, of Jewish law and Jewish life, and then you realize that uh, the, it's really only a few of those chapters that, you know, like our Jewish scholarship and Jewish life is really based on that, that huge sections of this of, uh, are sort of never, never developed. So that's, um, okay, I think we'll pause here. So Talmud, which I was uh, kind of excited to talk about. Oh, so, um, um, okay. So Talmud, so the mission's edited in the year 200, uh, but things don't stop there. The Talmud comes next. We'll talk about the next one. The next time we'll talk about the Talmud, and we'll talk about the post-Talmudic uh, period of the Rishonim, the medieval period, and that'll be next week. Uh, not next week, next week Rabbi Brand is speaking, which should be, right, he's speaking about uh, Holocaust, Halakha, uh, which I think will be very interesting and, and very powerful. The week after that, on the 16th, uh, I'm teaching again, and that will be, uh, we'll do the Talmud, and we'll do the Rishonim, okay? And uh, thank you for, uh, Uh, 9 p.m. Mark.